here we are. It is August 30th, 2023. And today, this is going to be the first of several videos we do on the upcoming sales down in New York, starting on in um, uh, mid-September, around the 19th and 20th of September. Um, there'll be sales at Christie's, Sotheby's, and Bonham's. And uh, this is the first sale we're going to cover because it, 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 it was the, actually the first one that I saw. And this is a Christie's sale um, uh, with, with eight Imperial wares offered by the Marchants over in London. They're, of course, the, the very famous dealer family. We've done interviews with them. They're really nice people. And uh, they, they they put together uh, eight lots for Christie's for this auction uh, that they thought people would love. And I did call. Um, I got a hold of Samuel um, and uh, said, I, I got to talk to you about this auction and find out what I can. And uh, he was very uh, kindly got back to me. And we, we had a nice Skype conversation about it and went through the pieces and so forth. And I'll tell you a bit about what, what he had to say. Uh, but this is an exceptional sale. And there's, there's a number of other sales sales coming up in New York too, but I wanted to start with this one because it's an unusual topic, um, Imperial Wan Lee wares, and, and you don't see many collections of them. There's not a lot talked about them the way they do some of the other emperors, and uh, it's, 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 it's absolutely some of the finest porcelain made during the Ming Dynasty. Um, without any doubt, and we're going to go uh, take take a stroll through them and uh, talk about why these pieces are so interesting to me, anyway, and um, their their rarity. And uh, when when you have eight things and there's only a handful of them, generally speaking, in the world um, for for one reason or another, it uh, I think it, it deserves some some good attention. And um, if you go to Christie's, you'll find that the catalog on the website, incidentally, this catalog has a lot of images in it. But if you want to see all the images, um, you have to go to Christie's.com and uh, find the sale. And you'll find that there is a slew of images for all these objects, very magnifiable, very finely done. And you can really, really see the details up close. And one of the first the first thing I'm going to talk about is the first lot. Uh, and uh, it was the first thing I talked to Sam about because it's an unbelievably rare thing. These are these uh, 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 flying uh, sea creature uh, uh, stem cups. And the first of these were made during the Young Lo period, according to the excavations they did back in the 1980s, when they were going down through the layers beneath the kilns. And they found a few of these in underglazed red um, from the Young Lo period, but not a lot of them. And then during the Xuande period, they found a few more of them, but n not many in underglazed blue, mostly underglazed red. This is one of these curious things. Um, underglazed red examples of these, from what I could read, seem to be more common than the underglazed blue ones for whatever reason. And uh, here you have this really, really fine underglazed blue example with the reversed out uh, decoration. In other words, the uh, blue is applied and then they left white areas of porcelain open to form the flying sea creatures. And you have flying elephants, flying horses, flying dragons and so forth on it. And uh, these are uh, uh, started out uh, uh, originally as Taoist symbols and then were adopted into the, um, uh, the, the, the nomenclature of porcelain decorators for the imperial families. And there's a whole lot about their symbolism and Zheng He, the, uh, the, the Ming eunuch who uh, went to sea with 28,000 people and all this other stuff. There's a whole lot about it. This one is very interesting because it has Sanskrit on the interior, which is something you don't see very often. Um, and then, of course, it has uh, uh, the, the mark on the bottom, which is right here. And Wan Li was a very interesting emperor. He, he was the, he was he, he, people don't know a lot about him, but he he was the longest reigning emperor of the Ming Empire of any of the emperors. He reigned for 48 years. He ascended to the throne at the age of eight, sort of the way Kang Shi did later. And um, uh, he was he was sort of under the under the control of regents and supervisors, of course, when he was very very young. But then he event he fairly rapidly took control at a at a young age, and he was a uh, by all accounts early on. He when he first came in um, for the first twenty or so years, he was a very effective leader, and it was actually uh, a, quite a good leader. He was getting their the financial house of the country in order, which was which had had problems during the during um, his father's reign, Long Qing. He was Long Qing's um, third son, and he became became emperor and uh, as I said he, he reigned up until 17 uh, up to 1620 so 1572 to 1620 um, but he sort of stepped back from d d direct day-to-day -day ruling 
so to speak, around uh, around 1600. Um, I think he, he, the, the write-ups that said he became disillusioned with um, how some of his edicts were being carried out, and he turned over a lot of the management, uh, sort of the day-to-day operations of, of the country to um, uh, uh, officials, um, to bureaucrats and things, who turned out, that turned out to be a mistake. Um, and uh, there was a lot of uh, dishonesty and a lot of stealing going on, and uh, the finances of the country began to deteriorate once he stepped back a bit. And uh, the imperial kilns shut down in 1608, and uh, then from there to the end, it was it was it was not a, a great time period. But he did manage to remain in in power, um, uh, like I said, for 48 years. But so you had things like this cup, very 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 rare, um, very unusual. I think uh, in the write up they said there may be two others in the world quite like this one, um, not 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 done often, <laughs> and. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful example. And it's expected to bring, uh, well, the estimate is three to $500,000, uh, which I think is, is, is certainly within, in the ballpark, um, because, because of the rarity, you have to consider the rarity, the quality of the work, because things can be rare and not particularly well done. You know, uh, this one is rare and very, very well done. And all these pieces are, we're going to go through them because the, the, the quality of the work, the history of the pieces, the rarity of the pieces. So you have rarity, quality, and condition. And um, and these aren't pieces that have been pushed in and out of the market, um, um, you know, in uh, auction in a series of auctions every every five or ten years for the last forty years. This is a beautiful example. And then you have this, the box. This is one of my favorite things. I just I love this box because of the decoration and the figures on it. And there's there's only one other like it apparently in the world. It's because of its size. Most of these boxes are seven or eight inches. Most porcelain boxes are seven or eight inches or so uh, in the square form. Uh, This one is a foot long. It's it's 12 inches by uh, eight eight inches or nine inches. It's a very, very big box for the period and uh, very difficult to produce. Um, these, these, to make these boxes, you always have to keep in mind that they have to roll out the clay, it's slab constructed, and then they have to put it together and they have to seam the edges. And when porcelain fires, it shrinks at the, at, at 10 to 15%, um, as, as, as it's cooking and it goes down. And when you're done, the whole piece has to fit together. Otherwise you've just, you've just uh, made a, a colossal, um, um, done a colossal amount of work for very, very little, uh, reward. And, uh, it has to fit, um, just like that. So this, this, there's the, the, uh, the interior of it. This reminds me actually of Boogle art a little bit, Indian art, the beautifully painted trees and flowers in it. And, uh, there's the interior, but this is what I was trying to point out was that when they, when they fire these, these two separate pieces, this piece here, the cover has to fit perfectly onto this. Can't, it can't nick it. And it's a pretty tight fit. Um, there is a slight, slight, slight warp, which you often see on the bottoms of even the smaller boxes. So don't, you shouldn't be at all surprised to see it on a great big one like this. And uh, the decoration is outstanding all the way around. And I think the idea of just putting trees and flowers on the inside of it and then having figural landscapes on the outside of it um, is a great combination. And uh, just a, an exceptional, there's, there's the uh, interior of the base um, with, you know, uh, you know, rocks coming up and, and, and blossoming peony trees and rivers and so forth flowing through it. So there you go. Estimate, two hundred and fifty to $350,000. But is that unreasonable? Not at all. Uh, that is a heck of a box. And like I said, there's one other, um, according to the write-up, that they're aware of on this of this size. And um, um, there was an, another box, maybe it was uh, slightly smaller that had belonged to, that's in the Aga Khan collection um, with um, uh, Arabic on it. All right, and then over to this, the uh, uh, Bakshik Shang um, uh, bowl, and we've all seen these before from the Qing Dynasty. They're quite, they're quite um, uh, common actually, uh, but during this time period they weren't. And this was, this was made, they believe, because of um, uh, Wan Li's uh, fascination and appreciation for. He was, he was a huge fan of the Zhuangzi Emperor and the Chenhua Emperor, and the Chenhua Emperor uh, porcelains were of course famous for their Daosai enamels, the most, you know, the, the Daosai cups, the Daosai bowls. Always small things, and um, they they occasionally did some. They tried to bring back Daosai enameling during Long Qing's reign, and it was sort of a failure. It didn't work. Uh, it takes an enormous amount of skill to to apply Daosai enamels, and that's why you don't see a lot of them after the end of the Chenhua period, where they were sort of on a roll with it, and uh, the emperor was thrilled to death that they could do them. 
um, for his personal stuff. So um, that was that. And, and then when the emperor, when that period ended, they sort of stopped doing it for them. Not stopped doing it, but they didn't do it in, for in nearly as much. And this one is outstandingly well decorated. That's the thing that caught my eye was the vibrancy of the colors. Um, they're 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 Daosai, but they're strong Daosai colors. And I love this tone of red on the flowers here. And then you have this this these different shades of yellow from a from a sort of an egg a deep egg yolk color to a softer yellow. And then these beautifully done uh, umbrellas. Um, in cobalt blue outlined in, in enamels again all the way around and uh, the bowl is an outstanding condition everywhere it's a really really rare bowl very rare and uh not a lot of history on it uh uh it was uh it was it was it was uh bought um um in japan um by from the by the marchants from a, a, a gallery there in uh, the 1990s they sold it it was in the private collection of the united states and then Eskenazi ended up with it somehow, and then he sold it back to the to the Marchants. So um, they obviously liked it because they they were more than happy to buy it back. And uh, it was because it's a rare thing. That's all. It's just a great rarity. Um, it's easy to it's easy to forget that, and you say, well, you know, why? Well, it, it's because it's rare. And, and, and rare things are always in demand. And uh, as I said, there's just a couple of these around. Uh, they did a few in underglazed blue of a similar pattern during the Ming Dynasty and so forth, a few other, but, but very, very few of this quality. So there you go. And uh, then over to this, the ingot box. This is a, a nice, nice ingot box. And the ing ingot form boxes are very rare, again, for the simple fact that they're very hard to make. And, and so that, that when, they, when they get fired, they don't warp slightly off and don't fit together. And uh, you have uh, uh, these are d doubly difficult compared to the slab boxes because you have this bowed in section here. And the bowed out sections on the ends and what happens is is that during the firing you have pressure going out and you have pressure going in at the same time so the box is almost fighting with itself and uh, you have to make it in two parts and then get them to fit together perfectly at the end um and 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 done in a beautiful cobalt enamel a beautiful underglazed blue cobalt uh very very fine um, uh, luminescent, uh, and, and, and notice the details of the dragons. It's a little stuff on these things that are just so, so superb. And yeah. it's a pretty good size box. It's uh what is it? Nine inches in length, I believe eight and five eighths inches, 22 centimeters long. And, um, it, they have, they have apparently the Japanese box that they got from, uh, Mayuyama company, um, where it was acquired from originally. Uh, no, it, it, let's see, Mayuyama went to a private collection in Chan and then Kiriyama fine arts had it. And then Marchant got it from them um, um the, the, the marchants uh, have some very strong relationships in asia over the years obviously because they've been around for so long and um this is the kind of stuff they get their hands on over there just amazing and uh estimated 350 to 450 thousand dollars beautiful piece and then this the goo form vase this of course is 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 a a, a, a beautiful vase about 15 inches tall and it's a goo form uh, a beaker vase uh, which is based on the early early bronzes mm -hmm. Uh, it's an early bronze form. And what's interesting about this, I, as Sam was pointing it out to me, was that the uh, the dragons on this are, uh, on, are has, has four dragons on these panels going around it. And the, the two of them are chasing the flaming pearl of perfection. And then the other two are ascending upwards, so they're writhing up, rising up into the sky. And the proportions of this vase are very unusual because the, 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 the upper rim here, this top, is wider than the rest of the vase. It's very, very wide rim, extremely wide. It's a sort of a miracle that it hasn't been broken. Um, there are other ex somewhat ex similar examples around. There's some with, with slightly different shaped midsections, uh, but this one has extremely good proportions. It hasn't been damaged. Um, the last one of these, uh, according to the write-up that came up, um, uh, was uh, a few years ago at Christie's or Sotheby's, but it had, they'd been reduced. They'd been cut down, um, uh, which which often unfortunately happened. This face has not been cut down. It has not been drilled, and it is because why would you? Um, absolutely, absolutely superb decoration. These very very soft greens, nice reds, beautiful yellows, and uh, and not a lot nowhere. I mean, you look at the piece overall, and it's an absolutely pristine condition. And like I said, it's 15 inches tall, estimated at three to four hundred thousand dollars. Beautiful piece of porcelain. And then this, uh, 
pairs of vases during the Ming Dynasty were not really a thing. Um, they did do them on occasion, but not often. Um, and that's why you don't often, like Qing vases, you often see in pairs. Um, Ming Dynasty, you didn't often see in pairs. And to find, to have two of these garlic neck vases, and they, they measure about 18 inches tall. These are pretty big. Um, and they are absolutely identical. Uh, I've seen assembled pairs before. And um, what is always the problem with them is is that the, the, there's something very different that's missing from them both. For example, in this one, um, you know that they're, they are a true pair because all of the border decorations, the, the field decorations, you can have you can have vases with the same overall field, but where they where they where they where they don't hold up as pairs is often with the borders. And here at the bottom, you have this this vine border, and this one you have the vine border, and then you go up the piece. All right, and you've got three lines blue, three lines lines blue running around and then you have the same uh, the scrolling motif here and here and then you have the uh, upper section with the buddhist beads and so forth and the scrolling decoration again around the top and with wanli marks on both all right and that's very unusual that is you know you, you, these garlic neck faces um, of this quality uh, a single cell for two or three hundred thousand three hundred fifty thousand you, you can look them up and uh, here you have a pair of them and uh, it's, you know, one of the maybe one other pair in the world. I don't know. I mean, I have I can't remember the last time I saw a pair of these uh, in, that were true pairs. And that's the, the big difference because they just didn't make them often. And uh, they're estimated at six to eight hundred thousand dollars, which seems pretty reasonable for something that rare. They're in beautiful condition. And uh, they came from the family, a collection in Belgium, the Bonta family. And, uh, the, you know, uh, Belgian uh, trading family, maybe descendants of who knows. But uh, they could have been in that family for, you know, hundreds of years. And the Marchants managed to score them. Good for them. And then over here to the the brush rest, uh, very we've seen these these um, uh, enamel decorated uh, brush rests before, um, like uh, uh, these sort of like mountaintop things with made it, made out of dragons. But what you don't see very often is this shape, this bowed shape. Typically they're straight. They just go in a straight line, and they they don't have curved bodies like this. The curved examples are exceedingly rare. Uh, there are only a few of them around. Um, and this one, of course, is marking period. And again, a technical feat to make, uh, because when you when you heat something and you put you have bends and bows and so forth, creates pressure, very easy to fail or crack in the kiln. And this is a scholar's object, of course. So it's 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 even got uh, uh, you know more interest than other small objects of the period would have. And again, um, made made for the emperor. All these pieces were imperial pieces. This is the, something, it's easy to get lost and say, well, it's just from the Wan Li period. No, these were made for the emperor of China, um, and they're absolutely beautiful. And this one is estimated at $150,000 to $250,000. And then last is the jar, which is one of the most interesting stories as far as history goes, because I asked Sam, I go, oh, where'd you get that? And he goes, well, he said, did you notice in the catalog the receipt? There is a receipt in the catalog. Um Richard, Richard, Richard Samuel's grandfather, Richard uh, uh, Marchant, bought this at a house sale in um, England in 1967. And Samuel said we knew we had it, but it was in it was in in the storage area in a box, and it was still wrapped in nine. It's always been wrapped in 1967 newspapers, and uh, he paid about 900 pounds for it back then, which was a, you know it was a you know it was a pretty good purchase actually back then. Uh, I think the pound was trading at six to one to the dollar, so it was about six thousand dollars back then. But it's an incredibly beautiful object, and if you uh, uh, come over to the uh, this is the the PDF file. Um, I kept it handy because I want to um, scroll down and this is the uh, house where the piece came from. And in the intro, you remember there was a photograph of the jar coming off this mantle. Well, that's the mantle um, to this house. And that house is called Eastwick Park. And it, this Eastwick Park uh, was once the home of William Keswick. And you may not know who William Keswick was, but if you've been collecting and interested in Asian art and Chinese history and, and the early days of Chinese uh, trade and Hong Kong and all that, um, there's, a, there's a name that will um, uh, jump out at you. Um, let me see here if, if, it's, if it's mentioned in here. Um, do, 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 well, it's Jardine and Matheson. I thought it was in here. It's in here somewhere. Oh, it's in the description down below, and you can read about it. Uh, Mr. Keswick's older sister... Or, or excuse me, grandmother 
was the older sister to um, Dr. Jardine, who f was the, one of the founders of Jardine and Matheson, which was a giant trading company that's still in business today in Hong Kong. And he went to work there and ended up rising up through the ranks. He was very, very successful. He was extremely smart. And they entrusted him with opening up their own branch in, um, in Tokyo, which he went, went ahead and did. And he became a partner of the firm after just being there for a few years because he was earning them so much money, I presume. And um, he, he did very, very well. And he went back and he became a, um, a, 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 a British official, um, a, a member, a, a, an MP, member of parliament. Um, had a long government service career, um, had a long successful career as an investor in banks and railroads, um, even in Peru and around the world, far-flung interests. It was extremely successful. And uh, the House uh, got passed down. And this was the interesting part of the story was that the, 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 when they bought this jar, it was from the estate of Alice Henrietta Keswick Pike. And uh, they didn't realize that the connection they didn't apparently i don't think they had maybe had didn't have the keswick part of it at the time it was just mrs pike's house and um when they went in to do some additional research on it after that they found out that he was he was the 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 jardine and matheson connection and uh the long history of of enter you know of of, of uh, exploits in china and hong kong and around the world and doing business and trade and so forth and uh that's how they acquired this jar and as I said, it's, it's it's in the photograph here, sitting on the mantle of this house. And uh, that is when Richard Marchant bought it and how they could possibly sit on this jar for 50 years. Um, and uh, I suspect part of it, judging from the conversation with um, with Samuel, was was that they they had it. They knew they had it. And um, they I think they were waiting for a good collection of other things to put it with if they're going to put it up for sale somewhere and let the auction market decide uh, what they think of it. So they they ended up with this this beautiful grouping of porcelains, all imperial, all top quality, all of them rare. And, and some some Mark and period pieces aren't that rare. They're Mark and period. You see them all the time. But these were not only Mark and period, but Mark and period for the emperor. And and that is that is a, a very special thing. And they have eight of them, um, which is which is a really really amazing representation for this period because you don't see it very often. And especially when the, when you're dealing only with objects that there are only a couple of them known. Um, uh, that makes it even more interesting. So good on them for having the uh, the, the spine to hang on to hang on to these objects over the years to build up a nice little grouping that would uh, garner interest in the market. And that's exactly what's happening. And the, the jar is estimated at seven to $900,000. There's a few of them around the world. That's about it. There's one of them in He Lee's book, I know, on, um, on uh, Im imperial wares of the Ming dynasty. And uh, there's this one here. So you know, we'll see how it does. It should do very, very well. It's an extremely beautiful piece, beautifully decorated, beautiful quality enamels, and in good condition. And like I said, it's been off the market um, uh, basically since 1967. And the company that handled the auction is still in business too. White and Sons, um, apparently they are, are uh, more into uh, real estate nowadays than they are in the antique and auction market. But the company's still going strong. It was bought in May 1967. All right. So that's it. Those are the eight lots. Um, pretty terrific, very terrific, uh, uh, very rare, and uh, and uh, gives everybody a chance to go in and really study up close with these great photographs that they provided. Um, all of the all the little minor aspects that you might want to look at, as though you were there. If you can't get to the preview, this is a pretty good uh, second best thing. All right. So we'll be back with other videos, but I want to get this one done. Um, there will be probably another three or four about these upcoming sales, and we'll go into those. Thank you for watching. Thank you for those of you that have uh, subscribed to us on Patreon. It's very much appreciated. Give us a thumbs up if you liked the video. Leave a comment. See you again. Bye-bye.